everyone. Welcome to today's Learn with Google webinar, Attribution Modeling for Digital Success. My name is Sarah, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. And I'm joined by Bill Key and Neil Hoyne. Uh, Bill is our Product Manager for Attribution Management and Multi-Channel Measurement. And Neil is the Gro Global Program Manager for Attribution. And both are experts on digital attribution. Before we begin, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. We always get asked, will this webinar be recorded? Yes, indeed, we are recording it, and you will get a link uh, in your email within a few days. You'll also see some widgets on your console. There's a Q&A widget. You can uh, ask questions at any time during the course of the webinar, and we'll try to respond to those either during the webinar or in a follow-up blog post. And we'll also take some live questions at the end of the webinar today. There's also a resources link where you can find some links to our website, blog, help center, and more. We do encourage social sharing on Google Plus and Twitter. You can use the hashtag attribution. And before you leave, please do remember to fill out the survey. You can see that little survey widget. Um, in fact, we will be entering people in a drawing to win a Nexus 7, so definitely don't forget to do that. And finally, if you haven't already signed up for our whitelist for the attribution modeling tool, there's a link here that you can see now on the slide, and that's also included in that resources widget. So please go ahead and fill out that form so you can get access to the tool. Um, so now before I turn things over to Neil, I just want to give you a little bit of background on, on why we're doing this webinar series. Um, Google makes the web work for you. Our products and services help you to win the moments that matter, enable better decisions, and constantly innovate so you can get more from your customers and get more from your digital marketing business. Today's we're really going to focus on the second pillar of enabling better decisions. Through attribution, you can understand better how your marketing programs are working, what your customers are doing, and therefore make better decisions about your future marketing programs. And now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Neil Hoyne. Neil, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. And thanks for joining us in this uh, fifth and final series for Attribution with Google. Now, Attribution, as we always said, is, is a very complex journey. It takes time to perfect, and it takes time to master, especially with measurement. And we've had a webinar series that supported that. So we started off with our first, with our first introduction to Attribution with really understanding what the market is doing, what opportunities other companies are seeing, why you should invest time in this, and what type of results you should expect. Now we went from there to really understanding the basics as to how to set up your data, how to set up Google Analytics correctly to be tracking your appropriate conversions and goals. And from there, we went into some of the easy opportunities that you can capture through tools like Search Funnels, which focuses on intra-channel opp opportunities, and also looking at multi-channel funnels, which looks at attribution opportunities across different channels, including display, affiliate, and paid search. Now from those webinar series, we've had tens of thousands of people join us, both live and over YouTube. And we've also received hundreds of suggestions, ideas, comments, pieces of feedback that we found invaluable. And we've had questions to say, really, what else, can we, what else can we build and how can we improve this product for you? So some of the feedback that we received was, you'd like to see longer look back windows. So instead of just looking back 30 days from a conversion, what about looking further? And with that, earlier this week we announced that coming soon by the end of this quarter, we'll actually have longer look back windows going to 90 days. At the same time, people have asked, can we actually bring in cost data so that we can actually look at ROI comparisons? We've also announced that as well, so that will be coming soon. And there's also been a lot of interest around getting this attribution modeling tool out of Google Analytics Premium and available to the mass market. And that's why we're here today. And we also have as part of this announcement that this attribution modeling tool is now available for a public whitelist. Uh, the link will be available through this webinar and also is available on the Google Analytics blog, as, long, as well as other information about these uh, other releases and improvements. And we're just getting started. So there's nothing more important to us at Google than our users. So the more feedback and, and the more comments that you can provide, the better that we can tailor this product to your specific needs. Now for this particular webinar, what we're going to be covering on the agenda is really what is attribution modeling? We've covered this several times before, so we're just going to start at a very high level. We're also going to talk about how you get started modeling with Google Analytics, uh, what you actually can use today, and how you draw actionable insights from these tools. Now with multi-channel attribution, Really what we're looking at is what's happening along the conversion path. So whereas most customers are simply looking at what happened directly before conversion, what we would call a last click, we actually now have visibility into the individual interactions that lead up to a conversion. This is the entire conversion path or conversion funnel. 
And the question comes up, well, how exactly do we value these individual interactions, right? And as part of that, there's also a question to say, well, what about, what about how we, we value things not only cross-channel, but within channel? So instead of looking simply at the trade-off between people moving between social and display, what about on the paid search side as people move from generic to brand searches and back again? How do those influence our ROI? How do those influence the decisions of the customers? And those are really the two perspectives of attribution that we look at. Now, the reason why it's important is really for several reasons. First is that most customers will actually have more than a single step in their conversion path. And most advertisers only assign, uh, of course, credit to that last marketing channel that touched them before the conversion. And because of that, we, get, we end up with CPAs that are guiding investments at a point where most customers have already made their decision. And unless you have a unique product or the lowest price, you really need to be available in the entire funnel to help guide customers to your company and to your products and offerings. Now, given that, many people ask, well, okay, can you just give us an attribution model? Can you tell us what model we should now be bidding on if last click is insufficient? And for that, there's a few perspectives that we take around attribution that helps guide our tools and guide our suggestions. The first is that there's no perfect model. There's only better ones. So the focus of this is not to find the perfect way to bid, but simply to iterate and improve on what you're already doing today. As part of that, these models also depend on your business strategy and customers. So we've seen many cases even within the same vertical where models just perform different way. It just depends on who you're targeting, what prices you have, and how you want to reach your customers and how they interact with your business. And even, and even it's critical to understand that you need to maintain control of all your marketing decisions. So in a lot of these cases, it's easy to put these variables, everything that could influence customer behavior, into a model and output a result that tells you where to bid. But we find it advantageous to actually keep that control with the marketers so that they can actually influence their own decisions and know as they change their business and their business evolves, how they make changes to decision as opposed to waiting for a black box. Now, let's talk about how we actually get started with these tools. So I'm going to hand it over to Bill Key, who's the product manager of both Google Analytics and the attribution modeling tool. Bill? Thanks very much, Neil. So we're very excited to be able to dive in and actually take a look at what it means to get started with attribution modeling in Google Analytics. Uh, as Neil mentioned, this is a new tool that we're making available to the market now that you can sign up for with Whitelist. And uh, I want to start by just going through the basics of how you can actually access the tool and what it can do, and then dive into some conceptual ideas around how to get the most out of it and how to make meaningful decisions. So to start with, where do you actually find this tool? So once you've signed up for the whitelist, uh, you're going to find the multi-channel funnel section inside the Google Analytics reports under the conversion section. And the past webinars that we have have covered what's available throughout the rest of the multi-channel funnel reports. So if you haven't seen those, I encourage you to look at them. But the attribution modeling tool essentially builds off of the data and the ideas that we have in the multi-channel funnel reports, which show you the steps leading up to conversion. So once you've chosen the attribution modeling tool, there's a series of options made available to you. You're able to see all of the channels that are most important to you. So you can either use the built-in channels that we show here, or you can design your own custom channel groupings, and then see the value that's attributed to those channels using different attribution models. So in this example, you can see the number of conversions attributed to each of these channels under a last-click model, uh, and then under a first-click model, and compare the difference between those to get a sense of how uh, your, your marketing can be valued from a different perspective. And what the tool lets you do is easily and quickly apply these models and compare them side by side in a very fast, iterative manner, where you can look at it at a channel level or dig in for more detail that I'll show in a moment. Finally, there's a custom modeling capability where you can take the built-in models that we have and add custom rules on top of that. And I'll walk through some examples of what that means. So let's start first with the basic models that are available in the tool, and I'll walk through and explain what each of them mean. So we have a last click model that allows you to apply all of the credit to the last interaction in the path. This is very useful as a starting point because it's often the perspective that you're coming from when you start. We can compare that to a first click model where we give all of the credit to the first interaction in the path. So this would mean taking the time of conversion, looking back at this point 30 days. Uh, as Neil mentioned, we're actually going to be expanding that to 90 days very soon, and identifying what was that channel that first introduced the customer. 
this can be very, very valuable for beginning to value those channels that uh, drive the first interaction that you have with your customers uh, and introduce them to your brand. We then also have a linear model that splits the credit uh, evenly across all of the touch points. And this can be useful in cases where you might have short paths where you might want to divide the credit evenly. So you can imagine a two-step path where you're giving 50-50 credit. Um, but it can also be useful for longer paths where you want to measure and uh, get a perspective on the frequency with which customers are interacting with a certain channel. If it's very important that your customers come back over and over again to learn and research your product, uh, this can be a useful model to get insight into that. We then have a time decay model that gives more credit to an interaction the closer it is in time to the conversion. So it's important to understand that this is really about time uh, and not about the actual count of interactions. So for instance, uh, if I uh, uh, apply a time decay model where I set the half-life to two days, uh, an interaction two days prior to the conversion is going to get half as much credit as an interaction on the day of conversion. And this can be really useful uh, for valuing those activities that happen very close in time to the conversion, uh, but, uh, uh, but may, be, may be iterative. So they may be something that a user is doing uh, over and over again. So if you're very focused on the bottom of the funnel, but want to make sure you're capturing uh, user attention during that very intense time at the end, uh, this can be a model to help you understand what your marketing is doing in that part of the funnel. So these are the base models. As I mentioned, we then also have a custom model builder that allows you to create granular modeling rules based on interaction type, position, and time, and, uh, and add these rules on top of any of the base models. You can do a lot of really interesting things with this to begin to call out the things that might be really specific to your business. Um, let me walk through some of the examples of how you might do that. So here's an example where we're looking at brand versus generic search. So I have an example path at the top, and then I've applied a linear model where I'm giving equal credit to all of the touch points. So there are five touch points, and each get 20% of the credit. But I've made the distinction between those search interactions that were generic keywords, so not focused on my brand, where I'm likely competing with other uh, competitors for the attention of my customers, and those branded keywords where the user has already uh, become aware of my offering and, uh, and is actually further down the decision path. And so what I've done here is I've actually applied a discount uh, to the branded search terms to give more credit, in this case, to the generic search terms to begin to understand what influence uh, they may be having in actually driving customers earlier in the conversion cycle. And an example of, of the type of condition that you can apply here using the custom model builder uh, is very, very simple. So I can essentially uh, specify that I want any keywords matching my brand terms. I've just written that in as an example here. You could input uh, your brand name um, and then specify that you're giving these half as much credit as other touch points. So it's very simple, particularly if you're familiar with some of the segmentation tools in Google Analytics. It utilizes many of the same rule building capabilities. Another use case is thinking about uh, how you value direct traffic. So for many marketers that I talk to, um, they regard direct traffic as navigational or indicative of a customer who's already been acquired. Now this certainly doesn't apply in the case of all businesses, and there are some businesses for whom direct traffic is a very important uh, signal of other marketing activities that they've done to drive awareness. But it can be a useful tool to look and see and exclude all of that traffic or all of those touch points um, that were not marketing driven to get a sense of what the specific marketing touch points were contributing. And so in this example, what I've done is I've taken uh, my path with five steps, applied my linear model, and then uh, set a weight of zero to direct. And again, I can build a simple rule that does this. I'm using the channel grouping uh, functionality to identify the direct uh, sources, and then I'm setting the weight to zero. One final example that I think is really exciting and demonstrates the power of what you can do 
uh, with tying all of the website analytics data to attribution is providing weighting based on user engagement. So it may be very important that each of the marketing, marketing touch points that you have on the way to conversion actually drive some engagement uh, with your content. And so in this example, what we've done is, again, take that five-step path, apply the linear model, but then we've applied a weighting based on the amount of time that users spend on site. So for instance, if I clicked on a paid search ad and spent a minute on the website, that's getting more credit than if I clicked on a link from Twitter but then immediately bounced from the website. Similarly, that last direct interaction that's shown here where two minutes were spent on the website is also getting proportionally more credit as a result. So this can be really valuable for identifying those marketing channels that are driving user engagement along the path to conversion. And again, there's a relatively simple rule that you can set. I'll show this in the context of the attribution modeling tool in a moment, but I've set a rule that says I want to distribute credit proportionally based on time on site. So those were a few examples of the types of models and the types of rules that you can set using the custom model builder. I want to switch to showing you the actual tool and walk through a few examples. So we're about to begin the demo portion of today's program. Before we start, you should take a few minutes to turn off your pop-up blocker on your browser as the demo will open a new browser window for you. If the new window does not open, there will be a launch screen, uh, a launch screen share link appearing in the slide window area. Please hold down the control key on your keyboard, click the link, and that should pass by any pop-up blockers you have installed. So it'll just be a short moment here while I launch the screen sharing tool. So here we are looking at the attribution modeling tool. So again, as I showed in the slide, what we're able to see are the, uh, the steps leading up to, or, or the, the various channels listed uh, that show the, the value attributed to each of those channels. So I have my organic search, social network, direct, etc. And I'm looking at the number of conversions and the conversion value attributed to those channels under the last interaction model. I can then go in and select an alternative model. So you can see the list here. We have various uh, versions of the last click model that I'm going to discuss in a moment. And then we have our first linear time decay uh, and position-based model. And then finally, we have some custom models, uh, and I'll walk through that in a moment. But let me first start by applying the first interaction model. And so I apply that, and I can immediately see how the value of these channels changes under this different model. So for instance, referral has gone from being attributed with $19,000 in credit to $35,000 in credit, an increase of 84%. Similarly, paid search has gone from $12,000 to $20,000 in credit. By contrast, direct, which is typically sitting at the bottom of my channel, has decreased by about 17% in value. I could further then compare that to a linear model. So we allow you to select up to three models side by side. So in this case, I'm setting a kind of upper bound saying I want to value really the first and highest uh, point in the funnel most heavily, and then I'm setting kind of a midpoint where I'm, I'm valuing everything equally. And you can see that there's, in this particular set of data, a bit, of, uh, a, a bit where we're, we're kind of splitting the difference here. So that rise from $19,000 for referral to $35,000 is almost half as much when we look at the linear model, so it increased by 40%. So this begins to give me perspective on kind of how these channels can be valued when we look at them from a different perspective. I could dig in, for instance, to any of these channels to see more detail. So with referral, I want to understand not just referral as an overall channel, but which specific referrals are actually responsible for this increase. And so when I click into that channel, I can see the various source domains that are sending me that traffic. And I can see that some of them are significantly valued differently under different models. So for instance, because this is the Google Store account, many Google employees are clicking through from our Google or Mall internal link. And they might do things afterwards, uh, and so the, uh, like come back to the site direct. And so therefore, my last interaction model isn't capturing the fact that that referral from Google or Mall was actually very, very significant. In this case, there are thousands of dollars in additional value that are being attributed under the first and linear models. 
So you could imagine if this were a certain type of affiliate relationship that I had, I might want to rethink the value that that channel is driving to me. Similarly, at the bottom, we can see channels that have actually decreased in value. So for instance, this domain, modifywatches.com, had originally been attributed with $232 in value, but when I look under the others, it's significantly less. So I may want to look at what users are doing after interacting with that channel to understand whether uh, that channel is adding all the value that I thought it was under the last interaction model. You can do similar types of, uh, of analysis at the keyword level and, uh, and dig into all of your AdWords um, activity as well. So I can click on my AdWords keyword or my, my, uh, my AdWords point of view and actually see all of the campaigns that I have for AdWords uh, reflected here as well. So for instance, I can see that the general uh, Google Store campaign is potentially contributing uh, about 60% or 22% more value depending on which model I look at. So this is a very easy way to begin to challenge the assumptions of the last interaction model. But I could obviously go further than the models that I have here. So for instance, with linear, um, I've gotten some interesting insights from that, but I want to make a modification to it. So I'm going to open up my custom model builder and I'm writing a model that is my linear but exclude direct model. So I've selected linear as my baseline, but I could choose any of the others. I can set my look back window. Here I'm keeping it at 30 days, but I could constrain it to a shorter period of time if I know that the interactions outside of that period uh, I, I don't want to value. Um, I could go in and set a credit as I showed uh, in the slide earlier based on the user engagement. But here I've actually just chosen to pick that basic channel grouping of direct and apply a weight of zero. So I'm taking that same linear model, but now excluding the value of direct. So if we go back and look at what things look like overall, we can compare the linear model to its variant with the weighting applied. And we can see that there's a pretty dramatic difference. So under a basic linear model, direct is still valued with $103,000. But if I exclude the value of direct, it drops to $74,000. So you can see how applying these types of custom weights can dramatically change uh, the value that's being assigned. And it can be really, really interesting to begin to test what your assumptions are about your marketing. If you valued social more highly, does it actually contribute more? If you value direct less highly, uh, does that change the way that your, uh, that your marketing attribution looks? So those are just a few examples. I'm going to switch back to the slides to walk through a few conceptual underpinnings that are important to understand. Great. So I think the, one of the most important things that we've found working with customers so far on this is that because the model, uh, modeling tool is so focused on comparing models, it's very important to understand what your starting point is. So if you're valuing your channels today, how are you comparing that to alternative models? And the vast majority of customers that we talk to are using a last click model. But last click is not a universal, uh, uh, it's, it's not universally the same across all customers. So I want to walk through the different variations of last click that are available in Google tools today so that you can understand what your starting point is. So the traditional way that users, uh, that advertisers think about last click is that you might have clicks from various sources like display, email, and search, and the last one in the set gets the credit for the conversion. But there can be some important nuances to this to understand. So in Google Analytics, in the reports outside of multi-channel funnels, the attribution model that's applied is actually a last non-direct model. So in this example, you could have clicks from any source uh, preceding a direct visit. So I could have clicks from display, email, and then paid search. All of those are non-direct. And then I could have any number of resulting direct visits. All of the credit is going to be given to the last non-direct source that occurred within the previous six months. So it's important to understand that the Google Analytics base model is already essentially excluding last or uh, direct when it's at the very end of the path. And that's one of the reasons why in the attribution modeling tool we provide last non-direct as one of the options that you can use out of the box. 
By contrast, the standard last interaction model used in multi-channel funnels actually does credit direct when it's the very last step in the path. So you could think of this as a pure last interaction or last session model where you're giving all of the credit to the last, uh, the last source even if that is direct. Another really common model that a lot of users uh, benchmark off of today is AdWords conversion tracking. So I want to take a moment to explain how AdWords conversion tracking's attribution model works and how you can understand that in contrast to the other models shown within Google Analytics. So AdWords conversion tracking gives credit to the last AdWords click in the path. So if a user clicked from uh, an email campaign and then from an AdWords campaign and then came back to the site via, via organic search, uh, the credit is going to go to the AdWords click because that's, uh, that's essentially the data set that AdWords conversion tracking is aware of. Um, so this is a, when a lot of the questions that we often get are around why the numbers in Google Analytics or in the attribution modeling tool are different from AdWords conversion tracking. And this is one of the chief reasons, because in Google Analytics we're taking into account all of the other touch points that could be included. There's a few other caveats that are important to be aware of. First is that it's credited to the last AdWords click within the account in AdWords for which you've set up conversion tracking. So you might have multiple accounts, this is very common among some customers, and the conversion is only going to be attributed to the clicks that happen within the account for which you have conversion tracking set up. Secondly, in AdWords, conversions are reported at the time of click. So if I were to click on an ad on January 15th and then convert on January 30th, that conversion is going to be reported on January 15th. So that can be another source of differences between this and Google Analytics where we report on conversions at the time of the conversion. So that conversion would show up on January 30th within Google Analytics. Another couple of things to be aware of are that um, in AdWords conversion tracking, there can be additional spam filtering applied to the clicks uh, to filter out conversions that still may show up within Google Analytics. And then finally, within AdWords conversion tracking, you have the option to uh, apply one per click deduplication. And what this means is that if a user clicks on an ad and then converts two or three times, only the first of those conversions is actually going to be attributed. The rest will not be considered. So these are some important things to keep in mind when you're comparing the numbers from AdWords and the numbers from uh, Google Analytics, and in particular, the attribution modeling tool. Uh, and it can be really helpful, we actually included in the attribution modeling tool uh, a, a last AdWords click model to help you begin to understand how this may look uh, when you're looking at it compared to AdWords. And I think uh, you know, part of what we're trying to do with the attribution modeling tool and something that can help you get value is to really have a better understanding of how your attribution is working today um, so that you can begin to look at that in the context of all the other options that are out there. So that's a quick review of the existing models. I want to dive into just a few more uh, high-level details around how you can draw actionable insights out of the attribution modeling tool. So I'm going to look at, at an example with a little bit more sophisticated data as well as some more sophisticated models so you can begin to think about how to use this. So what I'm showing here is uh, a set of data where I've applied on the left a custom uh, channel grouping where I've split out branded and generic paid search. This can be a really, really valuable distinction to make to begin to understand how your search traffic is functioning within a multi-channel context. And then I've compared three different models. I've taken the pure last interaction model, and then I've compared it to two custom models I've created. And a model I'm calling upper funnel, which gives a lot of value to the first and early interactions, and also downweights branded uh, search and direct interactions. Then I'm comparing that to a lower funnel model, where I'm not giving all the credit to the last click, but I'm really focusing on those things that happened within the last few days with a lot of concentration given to the last day of conversion. I've also downgraded here uh, some of the direct traffic so that I understand what my lower funnel marketing uh, channels are doing. Uh, after the webinar and, and in the follow-up blog post, I'm going to share the details of exactly how you can build these models um, so that you can get a sense of what they look like and actually uh, test applying them to your own business.
But I want to walk through a couple of the example insights that you can pull out of comparing these different models. So the first, if we look at the bottom, is display, which was attributed uh, at, under the last interaction model with the least amount of revenue. And what we can see is under our upper funnel model, it's actually contributing significantly more revenue, 162% more. So display is really showing up in the upper funnel when we apply our set of assumptions here and is probably worth a second look in this context. But we can see with our lower funnel assumptions, while it's also valued more, it's not valued quite as much. So I would argue that these create a kind of upper and lower bound of value to consider when you're considering the contributions of each of these channels. So display is, uh, is potentially, if I'm focused on my upper funnel marketing, providing a lot more value. Another interesting piece to look at here is generic search. And we can look at that in contrast to branded search. So generic search, even when I apply significant increases, uh, a, a significant look at the upper funnel, even though search is traditionally thought of as a very lower funnel channel, is actually providing significantly more value. Again, about 162%. But I can see, even when I apply my lower funnel model, it's also receiving about 66% more credit. So it's probably worth digging in to see what aspects of my generic search campaigns are driving this additional value both in the upper funnel and the lower funnel. The final one I want to point out here is social network. This set of data is actually a little strange compared to what I usually see when I look at, at social network data, where we'll see significant upper funnel contributions and less lower funnel contribution. Here, they're both, rel uh, both relatively unchanged when not looking at the last interaction model. So this is another example of where you can begin to dig in and understand uh, why your marketing channels may or may not be functioning as you expect. So I'm just going to give a quick example of what that looks like here when I dig into this channel. So you can see that while um, uh, Facebook is actually driving about the same amount of value throughout all of the funnel, uh, all of the models that are there, Pinterest is dramatically different when I look at the different uh, at the different models. So in fact, Pinterest is really driving the most value as a last interaction, which is typically not thought of as the function of social. So you may want to begin to think about the social networks that are driving you traffic in different ways. In this case, Pinterest really appears to be driving uh, at the lower funnel right before transactions in a way that other, uh, other channels are not. So those are some examples of the types of insights that you can draw by comparing models. What are typically the next steps that we see? So after, uh, after you've identified those channels that are performing uh, significantly higher and lower, um, one of the things that we encourage today is to take into account your cost data. So it's very important to look at this in the context not of just the return that you're getting, but the investment as well. Um, and as Neil mentioned earlier, very soon we're going to actually allow you to import the cost data directly into the report. So today that can be done via export but very soon you'll be able to do that uh, uh, by importing directly into the tool. The second step is really to identify those higher and lower performing keywords, campaigns, placements, referrals, and other uh, sources that I showcased in the reports, and give you an idea of uh, those things that you should potentially be taking a second look at. And the best thing to do here really is to experiment, to find those sources that you've potentially been undervaluing and see what it means to increase or decrease investment in those uh, and take a look at what effect that has. What this really does is begin to give you more of a basis uh, and more of a nuanced look at which channels um, you should potentially be looking at from a different perspective. So, uh, so those are some examples of exactly what you can do with the tool. We've got about 20 minutes left, so we're going to shift over to Q&A. We've had a lot of questions come in. So I'm going to turn things over to Sarah uh, for a moment to moderate.